All right. Uh, welcome everyone to the CPTSD podcast. Um, today we're going to talk about cult and religious abuse. Uh, Tabitha and I are not going to describe ourselves as deprogramming experts, but we are experts in the treatment of complex trauma and looking for patterns for how you know whether something is not good for you. Um, so without further ado, you can listen in live right now on Instagram. You can listen in live right now on the CPTSD podcast Facebook page. Correct. She's nodding her head. So without further ado, let's get right to it and get into this episode. Welcome, everybody, to Season 2, Episode 4, which is so exciting to say, of the CPTSD podcast. Um, today, we're going to be talking about, surprisingly, or not surprisingly, a complex issue, and that is religious abuse, cults, and um, and some of the tactics and techniques they use, how to identify it, and then next steps, if you realize you need some recovery from that experience. So uh, a couple disclaimers. The first is, as Beth was saying in our intro intro, we are not experts in this. There is a lot of um, support provided by people who are experts. So if you need that, we'll be giving you some links and other information that you can follow up on that. But what we're really going to be talking about today is the impact of what this type of abuse leaves, you know, how it impacts you. And also, um, I think we're really going to dive into some of the systemic nature behind cult abuse. So as usual, I am here with my friend and colleague, Beth Pace, who is a licensed professional counselor supervisor in the great state of Louisiana. I am out here in Oregon, also licensed professional counselor, licensed marriage and family therapist, and I do supervision as well. Um, Beth, do you want to start us off with a couple of ideas? Um, also, I just want to say super quick before you dive in that this came to our attention because somebody requested that we talk about this. So if you have a topic that you want us to put our two cents in, please go to the cptsdpodcast.com and fill out the review form there or the questionnaire form there, and we will do our best to address your concerns. We also are creating an email list, and uh, we're at the very beginning stages of that. So if you think you might be interested in getting more contact in your inbox from us, go ahead over to the cptsdpodcast.com and sign up there for that. So Beth, <laughs> thanks to our listener. <laughs> and uh, what, where do you think we should start this conversation? Where I actually want to start this conversation is we're not afraid of making people stretch and asking people to stretch, but we're also not here to bash religious people. We're also not here to, funny turn of phrase, demonize organized religion uh, people who appreciate the Christ, like the, uh, I almost said Christianity, the community and the um, like moral direction that comes from going and hanging out with a bunch of other people uh, once a week and talking about being decent for the rest of the week. I would love it if there was more of that. Yeah. That's not what we're talking about though today. So I want to be really clear for all of you guys that have a faith practice that feel really good about it. I celebrate you and am so happy that you do have it. We're not here to talk about, um, we're not here to just like grind religious people to a pulp. We're here to talk about a very specific type of abuse that gets mixed in with power and the intersection of your family of origin and how they interpret uh, being a decent person Based, based on like ancient manuscripts and then how that ends up twisting up your noodle about, I don't know, being queer, um, you know. Having value, all that crazy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that was this funny, y'all, but you knew that. Yeah. All right. So yeah, so where I, I want to start is I want to say, I'm not here to bash religions. I know a lot of really decent, lovely um, religious people one of the first people who ever opened my mind to this idea that like uh, 
having a relationship with the God of your understanding is supposed to feel like being loved mm. was an Catholic nun who became a nun when she was 18. By the time I met her, she was like in her sixties. Um, and I could just, everything I felt coming out of that woman was like, God loves you. I love you. God loves you. You are so good. Just the way that you are. Uh, may she rest in peace, uh, sister Marcy Romine. So I don't think there's anything wrong with people who have a religious practice and who are using it to be decent. And again, we're talking about abuse, manipulation, gaslighting, all the, the standards and practices for how to use you and then tell you that if you don't like it, it's on, that's a you problem. Right. And you'll be punished. Right. All right. So I'm, I just want to put my two cents in, Beth, that I agree. I think religion has been used beautifully throughout human history for community and for direction and for enlightenment. And I also think that it has been used horrifically. Right. And it's the difference between the intent and the purpose that we're talking about today. Yep. Mm hmm. And so if it's cool with you, what I really want to start with is, you know, and not to go too long on that, because I just realized, you know, how I feel about time. Yeah. Um, I don't have a, I don't have a watch in front of me, which of course means that I'm like stressed about time. Uh, so uh, we're going to try and keep this under an hour today. Uh, I say that I think every week, but let me start very briefly with human history and kind of what we're like. You can use religion to go to another place and justify taking their stuff, um, subjugating and enslaving the people who live there, and then calling it, bringing the good word of like, um, of the, bringing the truth, the truth to who needs it. So um, I've said this before, I think I said it uh, when we were doing you know, systemic racism and how that that is a CPTSD creator in the absence of, you know, a, a traumatic upbringing in your family of origin. Similarly, um, to go somewhere and say, I'm doing God's good work by crushing you into fitting um, our mold of what is goodness, what is rightness. And monotheism works a treat for that. Because if sure you're a does. Atheist, you show up and you're like, oh, cool. You have a different God lit. That sounds really nice. And then you find out about that God and you're like, oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, we kind of low key worship the sun, too, in a different way. But if there's only one true God. And it's yours. Then when you go to a new country, you can be like, oh, paganism, you are. So you're worshiping the wrong ones. So then it's okay for me to hurt you, crush you, or, you know, slyly get you over here. Cause maybe I'm going to ask you to like invite this one particular God into your heart. And that doesn't seem like a major commitment from you because you like have lots of gods living in your heart. You're like, yeah, sure. No problem. This one too. And this is the one where it's like, and then when you don't do what we think this God wants you to do, woe betide punishment comes. So Historically, from like a human history standpoint, um, settler colonialism, it doesn't actually matter who's doing it. I mean, European supremacy, white supremacy is the most obvious and salient example of this. Uh, but go anywhere else in other countries. It, it's easy to go repress someone using religion. So there's, a, there's an ancient human historical aspect of twisting up religion for your own really nefarious and dark uses. That's my, my primer, if you will. It's a great primer. And I mean, really, I think the point, point I want to underscore is that when you are going out with your faith to connect with other people because you love them and you want to support them with zero agenda, that would be an outpouring of pure and good religious foundation. When you're going into an area, whether it's just a group at, at your school or your work or wherever you're wanting to impact that with the idea that this is for their own good, there's a lot of power. Like I'm doing this for you. I'm abusing you for you. Because you don't know how to make good decisions yet, but right. I do. 
Mm-hmm. Right? Because I have the ultimate truth. And there's only one truth. It's handed down from a divine being that we can't even fathom, let alone feel like we're connected to all the time. And so you're going to be doing things our way from here on out. Yeah, even better if you can't read, right? So then I can tell you what the ancient, you know, scriptures uh, have to say. So, yeah, you know, I don't want a Christianity bash. Ooh, it's so easy. It's such like it's such low hanging fruit because like I want to go somewhere. But let's come back to then. How does uh, how would you define cult or religious abuse? Maybe more in the present day, even though most people who are going to be interested in this or send it to somebody else and be like, you should listen to this already know they already know that this is something they experienced but right. let's imagine that there's one person who's like oh could it be me how and there you, are would you yeah how would you define that tab so um i'm happy to define that and the first thing i would like to say to our audience who have already listened to our last episode and if you haven't go back and listen to the content we put out around narcissism because you are going to see a lot of overlap with what we're talking about right now. The foremost like telltale sign of a cult or a cult leader, because not all groups are cults, but then a leader can come in and usurp and take that group, right? That happens a lot, um, is that there is a, this authoritarian approach that we've been talking about. It's my way slash God's way or the highway, or I have special information that you can't possibly understand, so I'm in charge here. So when there's no flexibility, no room for input, it's a warning sign to keep looking for other telltale signs that might be there. And the next one that follows that is zero criticism, sorry, I'll get the word out, criticism, zero critique, zero challenges are allowed in the group. And when it's religious, that's even more powerful and oppressive because it's not just this person saying you're not good enough and you got to do it my way, but they have the authority of God behind them. It's overwhelming for most people. And let's remember, as I'm paralleling to narcissism, that not all narcissists, not all, not all, I'm apparently excited about this topic today. Not all narcissists are grandiose, bigger than life figures. Many are, but some are covert, right? And so there might be some subtleness to the things we're talking about today. So just keep that in mind. I think another really important thing to talk about when we're talking about an organized cult, like, you know, when we imagine people being rescued from that type of cult, is that there is rarely any financial disclosure about no budget information. Like, you have to give money, but you don't know what's happening with the money. Yeah, yeah. And that is a huge oppressive power, right? And one of the ways that cult leaders can really keep people enmeshed into the group is by creating a large experience of fear of the outside, whether it's your family of origin that you're not supposed to talk to or whatever, whatever it is, the world at large is bad and will hurt you. So you need to stay here with me. If you're starting to feel like you're not allowed to go out to experience other things, or you're finding that your fear is increasing, and you may call that awareness, that might be something to check into. So those are some big signs. There are more, but those I think are the really biggest. Um, Oh, one more to add. If somebody leaves the group, they are demonized, punished, excised, whatever the languaging is used, but not only that, but then they are used as a negative example to the group. And we don't want that. I mean, there's like internal human drives that keep us from wanting that. So it's another way to lock you in. Mm. What do you think about these ideas, Beth? Yeah, so far, I like I hear it. And I'm thinking it's really funny to hear you say this, that it was my experience growing up in a um, in a big, big, big church. I grew up in a big, big, big Southern Baptist church. And so we are going to talk about religious abuse and cult abuse because they are not necessarily the same thing, even though there are a lot of commonalities because big mega churches, you know, do some of them don't financially disclose in ways that are, you know, ethical, but a lot of them do. So yeah, it's going to be interesting to talk about the nuance between the two of them. The other thing I want to, um, I want to add to what you're saying is if there was nothing good, if nothing felt good about it, 
You know, if you went out on a date with someone and on the first date, they like flipped the table, screamed at the waitress and, um, you know, pinched you on the arm in front of everybody, you'd be like, this is nuts. I'm out of here. If there wasn't something that felt good in the beginning. Um, you wouldn't do it. And so there's also something about like religious euphoria. If you've ever been to one of those like church camps where everybody gets, you know, sort of swept away by the Holy Spirit, clearly I have, or I wouldn't know what I'm talking about. That um, mountaintop like, experience. Say what? The mountaintop experience. Yes, that like that wet eyed adoration, ecstasy, really. Like, is it, ex do you feel ecstatic, euphoric? Uh, and someone, someone very brave told me once that they went to seminary, which is one of the places that they got educated on how to do this yep. they grew up in an evangelical like structure. And like where they went was like, how do you elicit this sort of religious fervor from people so that they have this, this feeling of like bonding, bonding to God, bonding to each other and so on. And I'm not expert enough to tell you about like, like, I can only tell you my opinions. I can't necessarily say like, and this means, but I will say that like, if you know you have that skill, Tabitha and I both have been trained in quote unquote, motivational interviewing or motivational enhancement. But uh, depending on which side of the desk you're on, uh, it's just manipulation. Yep. <laughs> when our mandated like clients and addiction are trying to motivationally interview us into like, um, not disclosing their positive drug screens to their probation officer, it gets called manipulation. But when we do it, it's called motivational interviewing. So whenever there's power and then you are motivating someone to do something, you got to really check the power. So kind of what Tabby's saying is like um, disclosure. How does disclosure work? Um, but yeah, if there wasn't, we as, as human beings are seeking connection. We love it. It feels good for us. And then if we've got folks who are like, ooh, I know how to elicit a particular type of like euphoria, uh, ecstasy from being in this group, um, it's addictive the way that intermittent um, reinforcement cues up your dopamine release more so than does getting goodness every time you need it or you ask for it. So that's my that's my addition it's perfect because you're the the use of intermittent reinforcement which is what you're talking about is really a high level manipulation tactic right i do I just want to also say I was raised in evangelical Christianity, and um, my experience, for the most part, with people was really good. There were a lot of people at my church growing up who loved me, right? Now, it's also manipulative because of the way it came down in my family of origin. It was used as a hierarchy, right? But where I wanted to go is I was very immersed in evangelicalism until, and again, this isn't Christian bashing. You can find this pretty much anywhere you look. This is just my experience. Um, I was on worship teams, right? And we were taught, here's how you arc the music so that people warm up to emotion, have a big emotion, and then release emotion and feel settled. Now, when I was taught that, I fully, full-heartedly can say the person who taught me that wanted to help people have a loving, religious, community, worship spirit. The intention was so solid behind that teaching. And this is systemic oppression built into religion where we're doing it to each other and we don't even know it. And so while individuals can be innocent, the system is not innocent. Okay. Oh. I know. And I think I need to pause and sit with yourself and like, to like absorb that myself. <laughs> Like, yeah, you know, we got raised, we got raised in like evangelical Christian place and we're both like, and we're therapists and we're like, and we have CPTSD really does make you think. Um, so I, so when you're saying it's not just religion, it's not just like, we also, I think, um, one of the things that we're evolutionarily wired to seek if we didn't get it somewhere, or we didn't learn that it's inside of us, you know, spoiler alert, we're going to talk more about that later in the episode today is we're seeking an authority because it's very safety creating for us. 
So, so um, you'll hear, or I have heard a lot in my own clinical practice, people be like, where are the adults? And they really <laughs> want there to be good, healthy, securely attached people who like have life experience that they can supporting, like lovingly, supportively share with other people. So when we're talking about cult slash religious abuse, and I'm going to say it, and you know, I'm also not, I'm not 12 step mutual support bashing either, because if you have ever heard any one of our podcast episodes before, you know, I'm always like, go find a mutual support meeting, go get into community, but you know, where else is a really, um, uh, like right, uh, hunting ground for predators is places like AA is places like, uh, recovery support meetings where newcomers are lost and they're getting language very similar to, uh, religious doctrine, which is like, there's a right way to think and I'll teach it to you. Ooh, instead of the longer you, the longer you get to know yourself, the better you're going to be able to tap into touch your own authentic wisdom, which is going to help direct your path in this lifetime. There is a big difference between the one and the other. If you say it that way, but it's real subtle and it can sound real similar. And I was in mm. a train once in, um, in Taiwan and there was this big sign on a building that was like mothers and fathers protect your children from Tibetan Buddhism. And I was like, what? No, they, they, they're the good guys. They have to be the good guys, but I've got my phone with me. So I start looking at like the allegations of sexual abuse, the allegations of misconduct that like whenever some, whenever there's a hierarchy and the more high, the higher up you go, the more powerful you become, you can get addicted to the power. You can really believe that no matter what you're doing, um, you're doing God or the Buddha or, you know, whatever their good work. Um, someone told me once that they, their parent, uh, had been in, in AA and been sober for like buku big time forever years, like long time, 23, 25 years, had a ton of sponsees, which is to say people that they helped direct their path, didn't have their own sponsor, wasn't in their own therapy. This idea that like now that I've arrived somewhere wise, I can tell you everything about how to be humble, but I don't have to do that because I don't need to be humble anymore because I am a direct channel. God is giving it all to me. And that's where people like that start to get dangerous. So there are, there are people and I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap up. I know I've been talking for a while. There are, there are women in particular, people who are socialized female or who are trans, who are queer, uh, or who are just highly trauma impacted that will describe their experience of like going to AA or going to mutual support meetings as being groomed for abuse. And I would say they were right. Yeah. I just, I just got excited when I raised my hand because there is a current documentary. It's just a couple months out. Um, and I've watched the first two sessions. It's called The Deep End. It's on Hulu. And it's about a huge influencer, uh, spiritual influencer named Teal Swan. And I have had opinions about Teal Swan over time, you know, but if you want a nice, like, if you need to binge a little bit of story to understand what we're talking about, I would recommend watching that. And also, I'm so sorry, Lisa Rimini, but I can't remember the name of the series that she's doing about um, Scientology. And so there are just, there are some really good documentaries right now so that you can go look at if you're visual or auditory focused. You can go watch the smirks on their faces that are, I gotcha, smirks from narcissism. You can go watch the way they use the group to punish an individual for not complying. So that might be one way to do that for yourself. But I also wanted to point out, yep, AA, yep, all religions have the potential for this, all, because pe people are in all religions and that's who does the damage, is people. Also, multi-level marketing. 100% culty. Pay attention to that, right? Especially the shame cycles. Also, politics. 
that's going on in America right now. And I'm not going to dive into that because we have a lot to talk about. But this is religious abuse is not just about organized religions. It's about organized groups that use the hierarchy of religion and shame cycles to keep you stuck and to motivate you to do things for the group, not for you. All right, that was my soapbox for this like little segment. Um, I'll, I'll also add, uh, it's a, it's tough to watch, but, um, gives, gives you more, um, it's on Netflix. It's called keep sweet, pray and obey, uh, trigger warning. There's, there's child sexual abuse and like sex trafficking in this docuseries. Um, I did watch it. Um, and now, now I think it would be good to talk about kind of like the patterns of abuse and how this sounds, especially as it relates to like your own family of origin. But one of the things that like the men in power, uh, so there's no there's no democracy as it relates to these sorts of things. It's like whoever is in power um, either is is um, divinely chosen and then whoever comes into power next is clearly divinely chosen. And then when everybody's like, but this guy's monstrous and they're like, oh, no, no, but I'm divinely chosen. There's this way of collecting people, um, getting getting you close to power, holding the power and then doling it out in a little bit, little bits that allows you to feel like um, that's addictive too. power is really addictive. And the idea around keep sweet by, by this, uh, the language of this religious group um, is don't become overly emotional. Don't get angry. Don't talk back don't stand up for yourself. So when, and if your gut is telling you something, um, that stands out to you as like real bad, real bad news. Um, you keep sweet, you take that, you put it somewhere. So the, so not emotional expression, but emotional repression as the goal. So have we defined cults? Could we define cult abuse as a, as a beginning? I think so. I mean, I think we gave the the top indicators of what a leader would look like. And that is important because that's where all the information from a cult comes from. Right. And so I think the way you just said that, Beth, was excellent. So where do you think we should take this conversation, you know, for our listeners? Yeah, I actually would really like to now add religious abuse in a family. So, oh, please, so let's the do it. Church, the church might be sounding one way, or your parents may have chosen a particular type of church because it sounds that way, okay? Yep. So the sin, <laughs> the shame, the hellfire, the brimstone, the rededication of your life to being good. I could never wrap my mind around that. I was like, yo, I mean, if I got quote unquote saved and I got baptized, and then I was like, for sure going to heaven on the other side of getting dunked, then why do I have to be sorry all the time if I'm for sure going to heaven? Cause I got dunked. Right. Um, and so now or, or really sprinkled or sprinkled. sprinkled <laughs> dunked, sometimes sprinkled. Um, so then, you know, what does it mean for a parent to use, um, God's ire, sin, shame, that kind of Old Testament God. Um, cause obviously I'm talking about Christianity and that, because that's my experience, but, uh, I'll really try to stay away from, um, keeping it, getting too, too, too specific there. Uh, so religion filtered through an abusive family system. <laughs> well, you asked, what is it setting you up for? And I would say a lifetime of suffering if you're not aware that it's happened to you. Because the fundamental thing that happens in cults, whether they be and religious abuse, is that regardless of the outcome, the goal is to suppress you. Be a shame in particular, right? And they might say it's guilt, like in the sense of sin, but really it's shame. And I just want to address the word sin. I just heard it come out of my mouth and it's, <laughs> it's one of the ways I got attacked was through the idea of sin. So it wasn't somebody saying it to me, it was God, 
right? And sin is a translation, right? And what sin actually is, is an archery term, archery term meaning that you've missed the mark versus you're not good enough, you're not valuable, you have no worth. It's like, whoops, sin really means accident, like you didn't quite make it, either what you wanted to do or what you shouldn't have done. And I'm saying all of this, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit, so let me get to the point. No, I'm we have taken okay we've taken this idea of sin which is like i've i've missed the mark i didn't do it perfectly well welcome to humanity she says she as she leans into the mic right well, well nobody's perfect and they use that human quality against you mm-hmm. repeatedly now in my family it was coercive i was going to church whether i wanted to or not and i'm not talking about once a week on sunday i'm talking about sunday morning sunday night wednesday night My dad did work around the church, like physical labor, because he was a contractor. So I was there after attending the school all day. So I was immersed. And you may think that's helpful to your child. And if you're putting your kid in a loving Christian school, and I'm not going to go off too big on a tangent, if you're putting your kid into a loving Christian school, please make sure it's loving. My, My school was loving. But here's an example. Oh my gosh, I'm feeling a little vulnerable, but I think I'm going to share it. Here's an example of what religious abuse looks like systemically. So I'm adorable in my sixth grade year, right? I've got my puffy jacket on. Those were totally popular. My hair was so cute because my uncle had gotten his hands on it finally. Um, We can talk about my uncle another time. My dad walked me into my classroom before school even started, first morning, we got there early so that we could have privacy, right? And he told my teacher, if she disobeys you, you have my permission to spank her. The teacher, I may be making this up now, it's been so long, but in my mind, the teacher's face was like, what? (laughs) Right. That let me know I had no rights. He wasn't going to support me if I had a problem and I'll be hurt if I get out of line, whatever that is. That's just a real quick snapshot. Now, a lot of people might say, your dad was just saying that he supported the teacher and he was giving him authority. Mm -hmm. And I say, BS, that's not what it was. That was keeping me down. My teacher already had that authority, not to hit me, but you know, Okay, that's my story. It's a really good snapshot of what a little piece of covert spiritual abuse can look like. Well, you also know your dad, right? Like we've we've talked in past podcasts about like that look in his eyes where like he knew he had gotcha. Um, so I'll I'll speak a little bit about um, just things I've heard in the past, which is why when someone kind of comes, it's really normal to like have this sort of have anger at uh, at whatever age you are when you start to do that waking up piece. Yes. And that's another thing that gets um, repressed and suppressed in these types of circumstances, that if you feel anger uh, towards, you know, whoever is that higher up, that's also considered to be like pretty sinful. And now let's let's add in, you know, um, like a sexism piece to that. So you might be the identified um, caretaker as a child of your younger siblings. And whenever you're like, hey, I think it's kind of messed up that I have to like put my little sister to bed when I'm like 10, but yep. that my brothers get to do whatever they want. If you actually brought that sort of concern to your parents and they would look at you and go, helping other people is the joyful gift of your life. So they're not saying your anger is wrong, but they are saying that your anger is wrong. Um, If you make a mistake, you learn and grow, you try smoking, like I did in the seventh grade. (laughs) Oh my goodness, (laughs) you rebel. And and, you know, and in small town, North Louisiana, that was you, I got in major big time trouble in my family. I also got kicked off my soccer team. Like it was intense. Um, And, you know, all that to say, it's funny because like when you do end up going to therapy, if you decide you want to go to therapy or you do end up processing some of these memories, 
what sounds to someone else like that's probably not that big of a deal. Oh boy, I'll let me put a, a bookmark here. If it mattered to you because it was like a it was a moment where like you couldn't just be like learning and growing and making mistakes, and someone told you that you were sinful, shameful, uh, and gave you like extreme consequences for you know a reasonable size you know life mistake or or life choice at, as a, a small person. Um, it matters so many times my CPTSD clients will be like, this is not big enough to like, I, this messes me up. I think about it all the time and I'm ashamed and embarrassed of that instead of, yeah, it mattered because of the grand theme of what your upbringing was like. So all of that to say, when that happened to me, it was like, I can't even look at you. You have let me down. You have let this family down. You've let God down. Yep. Um, and so the the thing I want to say is that your, um, mm, this is what I want to say. I'm glad I remembered it. Louise Hay, <laughs> my personal Lord and Savior, Louise Hay, yeah. um, will say in her book, which I think is really touching. I can't remember who she references, but this uh, like woman, I think maybe she's a psychologist or a psychoanalyst. Her theory um, and I want you to think about this for a moment, um, is that three, three years old is, is prime time for this three and under your concept of God is indistinguishable from your, your parents, from your, concept yep. of your parents. So if your mother is overbearing, smothering, scary, um, emotionally, withholding and then, you know, wanting like super invasive, that's what you think God is like. Or if your father is punishing, vicious, always looking for what you messed up on so that you're in a state of like heightened, like hypervigilance all the time, you, you, that's your concept of what God is like. And so then if yep. these people are also like interpreting to you, this is what God thinks. This is, this is what God wants you to be like. And they are the people who you're essentially projecting um, your parents' worst qualities onto God. Asha Clinton in the um, in the True Origins Protocol, there's a part uh, in Advanced Integrative Therapy. I'm sorry, I'm speaking shorthand to Tabitha. There's one of them in the True Origins Protocol that's like one of the true origins of whatever is the traumatic issue is my projection of my parents' worst qualities onto God. Because I, th these people are in indistinguishable and Louise Hay is very short example, which tickles my funny bone. Every time I hear her say it is if we're just this minor, like little planet around a minor little star in this minor, you know, galaxy in this major massive universe the God of, of my understanding or the God, the higher power of Louise Hay's understanding is too big and too awesome to be spending all of their time staring at this teeny weeny planet, staring at you, caring a whole bunch about what you're going to do with your genitals. Every <laughs> time she says that, it makes me laugh. Yep. Because she's like, so then if this God is awesome, created the heavens and the earth. What are they doing being so petty as to care who you're having sex with? Miss or how? Or how? <laughs> and if we got created in God's image, why did God give men a prostate? <laughs> and if we were created in God's image, aren't we all okay right now? I know it. <laughs> you know, blown. tab of the bird, we will blow your mind. Um, we are so then recovering from this tab. What does that look like? Well, if you are, I think it looks different for every person, but there are some trends, right? But I want to go back real quick, Beth, and say that um, I took a great class in my grad program called Images of God. 
And the purpose of the class was to help us as, you know, these new upcoming clinicians understand that spirituality is in people, whether they know it or not. And this is, and whether they want it or not, because spirituality is about who you are, what you're doing, what's purpose, what's your intention, what's your goal, how do you move through life, right? It's not about one answer. Um, anyway, and so we can do it however the heck, that was an immediate sense, or however the heck we like, we can practice spirituality when we get these images of the divine in us, because at three and under, we're still fairly nonverbal. We're trying, but we're coming up with words. We're starting to construct sentences and paragraphs, right? We not only install the projected of God within us, but we also install, and what is our relationship to God? And I mean, Buber talked a lot about the I-Thou relationship, and this is the key issue in all personality disorders. I think it's a key issue in post-traumatic stress disorder, especially from childhood, that who you are in the context of who God is, is really important. And so there is going to be a bleepity bleep ton of grief that you experience. And I really am saying that I'm hoping very directly so that you begin to prepare for it. Because even though you know that's probably true, it's going to go deeper and hurt a lot more than you might think it will. Mm -hmm. And it's still worth the work because that's where the freedom will come from. Right? So the first thing is specifically, if you are, think you're in a cult, if you think you're in a cult, find expert help <clears throat> because if it's a true cult, they're not going to let you go. Right. And that is a safety issue. Right. So um, especially if you have given money to that cult in, in any terms, but large sums of money, they really will not let you go. So if you think you need out, find an expert to help you. Um, I'm looking right now at culteducation.com. There's a lot of information here where people can just, you know, go get their toes in the pool. If you're talking about what probably most of our viewers and listeners are going to experience, which is the recovery from religious abuse. The first thing I would say is find a therapist. And I'm going to say that for everything we ever say on this podcast, because therapists are trained. Here's, here's why I like therapy. And again, I also like coaching. This is pretty intense. So unless your coach is a specialist with some kind of certification that I'm not currently aware of, please find a therapist because of two things. Number one, we have a ton of education and experience. Most of us have to hit 3000 hours working with clients before we're licensed somewhere in that ballpark. But secondly, and this is really important for your safety, emotional and spiritual safety is licensed therapists are held accountable for their behavior by boards. Coaches are not. So again, I'm not slamming coaches. I have a coach right now, <laughs> right? But, but for this, you want a therapist. Actually gonna um I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with you <gasps> okay. and here's why um because I believe that we suffer so deeply in having complex post-traumatic stress disorder or like having anything an addiction CPTSD codependency whatever part of the programming part of the misery is I am terminally unique and no one can help me and what I'll say to you is if you, if they're safe, which is not always the same thing as well-trained people who go to years of seminary and have PhDs are well-trained doesn't necessarily make them safe. So the garbage man can hold space for you if they are a safe person and you, and they're not going to hurt you. They don't have an agenda. So when I say hold space, like, I mean, can, can handle being around your anger, can handle being around those feelings of despair, understands, um, you know, my new kind of interview question for anyone that I want to work with usually sounds something like, and where is your spiritual center? Meaning that if I want to come in and talk about like God, the God of my understanding, you know, whatever it is, my spiritual life. I don't want you to sort of roll your eyes and tell me um, that, that that's not uh, 
that's not clinical or that's not, you know, whatever it is. So the reason that I, um, the reason I disagree is because there may be someone who went through what you're going through, who is equipped to, um, to help you. And, and if your noodle is totally twisted up right now and you can't trust yourself and you don't know how, then Tabitha is right because you do actually need someone who is emotionally very, not emotionally removed, but like understands where they stop and where you start to help you. So then that way you don't get, you don't get sicker because they're not, um, they're not equipped. Cause I'll also tell you, there are a bunch of codependent, not so healthy, uh, clinically, uh, trained mental health therapists who get all tangled up and then the power differential shows up anyway. Uh, I can't of note a client of mine years ago was like, I loved my last therapist, but we ended up talking about their daughter's wedding all the time. And I couldn't say to them, we got to get back to me (laughs) because I didn't want to hurt their feelings. And so I was paying the money to go listen to them talk about their daughter's wedding because I didn't know either know that I could report them to their board for that. And I didn't feel comfortable remotely standing up to this authority figure that I loved. So in, in one of my, you know, in my interview and intake with new clients, I'll say, you deserve the right to understand how to file a complaint about me, how to make a grievance and, and to know that you can do that without any fear of reprisal or retaliation so that we keep the, we keep the nature of this relationship egalitarian. I work for you. I'm not, I'm not your, not your servant, but I work for you. Right. And I'm also not the one with all the answers. And I think, Beth, um, I really appreciate you disagreeing because that's the right thing to do. But I do think we might have also been talking about two different things. Because if you are just now waking up, I agree with Beth, you find whoever you can that is safe, and then proves they're safe. Right. And when you start really unpacking, especially if this has happened from childhood up, when you start unpacking the deeper trauma of that, interview therapists. So, I mean, I, I, um, I think starting with a garbage man is also reasonable. You just need somebody to believe you. And that is the most important thing because you might be having a hard time believing yourself. That's one of the tricks of religious abuse. Yeah. Right. So Beth, we've got about 10 minutes left. And um, I just want to add a side note there that if your therapist currently is only talking about themselves, I would highly encourage you to challenge that because they need to grow. Right. (laughs) And one of the things in this Teal Swan documentary that I'm talking about, like within the opening 20 minutes is somebody was sitting in a group with her saying, "Um, I'm challenging you. Or I don't have to believe everything you say just because I'm sitting here. And she tore him a new one saying, you're not trusting me because I don't have a mentor. Because there's no one above me. And inside of me, I'm like, and he's right. Yeah, we all need that accountability. So we can start scooting into the wrap up if you'd like. I think one of the things that I would like to talk about is how do you know if somebody's healthy? And when we're talking about leaders, this would be a therapist, a coach, a new religion, whatever type of leadership, you're any any of those things, whatever whatever that is, right? So your mutual support group, not necessarily just like the one person. So yes, I'm so glad you brought that up because like you hear me all the time say, go get into a community, go get into a community. And, you know, how, how is your discernment around like, and when your, when your ears prick up and your red flags light up, then what, and then what, right. So, um, cause yeah, I, I let's, if we can, we'll carve out like a couple of minutes to say like, and how do you know it's healthy? So then we can talk about like spirituality as like this individual relationship and also something that is a gift of recovery not necessarily a requirement of a functional recovery. So how do you know it's healthy, Tab? Well, number one thing is that um, I think the group and the leadership should be open and willing to participate in questions. 
and in clarifications. Because if they can't do that, then there's something shady or they don't know. And either way, they're not worthy of your participation to the degree they may be requesting, right? So you definitely want to be able to question and challenge the leadership and the system as a whole. Um, and I think the other thing is that when you're looking at the leadership, there I would encourage you to find something that has some kind of democratic process to it where people can contribute because we are all here and we all have good ideas and we all have ways to shape. And so I think the healthiest thing to remember is that if it's one person with their way or the highway, it's not going to work out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about you, Beth? Um, yeah. One of the things I still love and will never stop enjoying about peer led support that it's circular leadership. There is not a, there is not a group leader that responsibility is meant to change. And so, um, you know, if you're, if you care about the stuff or you're interested, you know, if, if you, if somebody goes, well, AA is a cult or like mutual support is a cult, go find out if you care, if you care and you're interested about how it got formed and then how it stayed functional long enough to be around for almost a hundred years, which is that maybe in the beginning, having there be like the, the leader of whatever, turned out to like make everybody sick or sicker instead of better. And then they realized like, here are some of the other ways to do this. So as Tabitha is talking about democratic process, talking about circular leadership, which is meant to be the antidote to hierarchy, the higher up you move, the lonelier you are, the less support you get. The reason that I can in the, in the moment be like, I disagree with you tab is because Tabitha is not my queen and neither am I hers. We just are in a mutually supportive egalitarian relationship with each other that we regularly get to stretch and grow by having tough conversations and being courageous in that way. So there's a sensation of safety. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those places where we've, we've talked about in the past, how do you know it's healthy? If it gives you that feeling of like, euphoria, ecstasy, that may be a red flag for you in the beginning instead of, oh, finally, this feels like home. What did home feel like? What did your church home feel like? What is, like, what is the definition of safety from your OG um, patterning related to like spiritual, religious, or cult abuse? Safety is never asking questions. Safety is resting in the lap of the master and never uh, <laughs> and never growing up uh, is staying childlike in your belief. Um, so then you get to operationalize what safety means in present day. And then you can go do your interviewing. Well, what does safety mean to you? Um, someone in in my life uh, is a is a long term member of mutual support programs. And told me recently that they went to a meeting and they were like, you know what I hate about this place? That the bar is so low for membership, that all you have to do is be sober, like we're just to say not using substances and then you can come do whatever you want. There's a bunch of predators in this program and I hate that. <laughs> and that everyone, that this is their expression to me and that everyone in the room was like, thank you for sharing, keep coming back. No one afterwards was like, you're not. So you can, you can find a church. You can find a spiritual support group. You can find a meditation group. But if there's people, that usually means that there is going to be a personality, some personalities that, um, that don't jive with you or that collect people. And if this feels like, ooh, 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 and it lights up that kind of trauma butterflies in your tummy, let that be an alarm bell instead of like an invitation to just dive in head first. Yeah, I, I just want to second that. And I've been around a lot of churches from pretty much white evangelical through um, a beautiful black church here in Portland, Oregon, that was one of my favorite places to ever go. 
So I've seen a lot of different brands and what I'm telling you is this, not only is what Beth's saying accurate, but if you're in recovery and you end up going to what's known as a charismatic church or something that functions on super high emotionality, you are substituting. That doesn't mean emotion's bad, but I have seen a lot of people come to more charismatic churches to get the emotional high that they used to get from using substances. So I'm not saying emotion's bad. I'm not saying charismatic churches are bad. I'm saying if you're in recovery, that red flag might be super real that Beth is talking about. And because we're still stuck in the old paradigm, it's changing, but we're still in the old paradigm of how hierarchical systems work. If you're looking for a new church or a different church, regardless of the brand, find out who is on the board because most churches have to have boards and if they are all wealthy or all white or all part of a social group that you're not part of that's not the church for you right because if you are black and you're going to an all-white church they don't want you and i don't mean that against christians i'm talking about a specific structure they don't want your input is probably more what i'm trying to say and we need your input this planet needs your input. So one of the so. things I want to I want to add because we're going to share a few resources um, is you don't ever have to go involve anyone else in your spiritual practice if you don't want to. Um, Word. Let me see if I can remember his name. Um, shoot, I will put a link in the show notes. There's this guy who converts to Quakerism, which is basically like. Me, direct act access to God. Me, God. Me, God. That's it. And he said that after, um, at, he, I think he wrote an essay or a book about this, that on the other side of that conversion to Quakerism, he fell into the blackest depression of his life. Are you talking about George Fox? No, I'm talking about okay. the guy. Um, and he was on, on being with Krista Tippett, which I'm pretty sure is when he talked about this. So we'll either put that episode or like this guy, this guy's oh, name. It's current. Got it. <laughs> um, but that, that feeling your emotional life is part of, of being a spiritual being that like with us having the capacity to imagine something greater than ourselves was an evolutionary massive step for us as a species. But you can have a spiritual practice that is entirely your own business and that you don't have to include anybody in it. And if you want community, you can go find like a meetup group for all of the people who are knitting in your community. <laughs> and then you guys don't have to talk about God. Your relationship with a higher power of your own understanding. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to 12 step because I support it. I love it. Um, adult children of alcoholics and family dysfunction makes a lot of space for this idea that having a spiritual life isn't about a get you God or something outside of you. It's about getting in touch with your own deepest, wisest self, which usually is a wounded inner child, not a big, heavy eyebrowed Monty Python looking dude, you know, peeling the clouds back to be like, I've been watching you. It's actually you, the little voice in you. So whenever someone tries to say something like God is elsewhere, I'm here to say that divinity is in you. It's already in you. And trauma treatment is a return to wholeness. The most spiritual experience I've watched people undergo in my young life. Me too, Beth. And I just want to reiterate that you're absolutely right. You do not have to participate with anybody else to have a spiritual experience. And in fact, I would suggest that if you are participating in a community, you also have an independent spiritual practice of your own. You need it. Yeah. Right. So it is about going in and finding that peace. It's also about awareness of what's around you. And I don't mean that in a controlling way, but I have met some people whose church is going fishing. It's the most important thing. They feel peaceful. They understand what's going on around them and they're tapped into all. And that is really lovely. So no matter what works for you, please embrace it. And if you're hearing Beth and I say things to you today that tell you in your own mind that we think you should do it a certain way, that's not what we're saying. And so we'd like to correct it. 
or support you in letting go of that belief that we know better than you what you need. Or, you know, one of the other things you're welcome to do is, um, and I'm not trying to be flip here. You can, you can write it. You can rate the podcast on whatever, you know, medium you're listening to it. You can send us like one of those contact forms on the CPTSD podcast website and be like, hated it. Um, and ultimately, you know, you can also uh, stop listening. And I'm not being hard. I'm not saying like, get out of here if you don't like it. But like, that's the whole point of having choice. There are yeah. hundreds into thousands of podcasts you can be listening to. And if this one isn't the one you like, that's okay. But you can find whatever you need. And that's also something that kind of no matter where you are, I believe that within you, you who is listening right now, I believe that you already have everything you need to heal and return to health and wholeness. But sometimes it's the core beliefs that we hold that feel like reality that are the impediments to us feeling whole right now in this moment. Like I need to be inseparable from a particular group of people or from whatever, or um, I'll be deprived if I'm healed, you know, of my church, of my family, of a certain way of, of living or being. And so I lost the thread and we're at our time. So there's one, there's one podcast actually that I would love to shout out. Uh, it's called post-traumatic faith. Uh, her mm -hmm. name, Jill Riney. I think you can find it on Apple podcasts or just a quick internet search. Um, she, she will describe herself as a CPTSD survivor, that kind of like discovery waking up she regularly has guests on the show so it's not just her and kind of like an echo chamber um and i i want you tab tell me about that who's this boober cat i wrote it down the i thou relationship oh for the love of god i know brent would remember his name but boober is he's an old old writer like from 1700s Ty. yes thank you I'm so glad you knew that. I kept wanting to go with he with Herman, but that's not who it is. So the I thou relationship is really the fundamental base basis to attachment. That's what it is. And so I I just wanted to add as we're closing that if you choose to leave this podcast because it's not a fit for you anymore, we celebrate that. I mean, we want people to come here and get help, but it's also sometimes time to go. I'm going to put a link. Um, all of these links we'll put in the uh, description down below the YouTube or the podcast, whatever you're listening to. Um, I'm going to also put a link in there to a chart by a guy named Kohlberg, who created a chart called Moral Development and what that looks like. And that might help you figure out where you're at and what your needs are, especially around community and safety. I'm going to wrap us up unless you have anything you want to pop in there, Beth. All right. We're so glad that you were here today. We have only begun to scratch the surface of this. And if you feel like you need more information, Google and TikTok have a ton of stuff that you can find. Just remember, it's not all good info. So put your thinking cap on. Um, CPTSD podcast can be found on Instagram and also Facebook. If you would like to join our free group, we have a group there where you can go in and just share ideas. Beth and I are not using that group to coach you to do anything other than help facilitate connection and communication. So um, please feel free to go sign up. And uh, we really look forward to seeing you the next time. Thank you so much for being here today. That's right. Um, you can follow us on TikTok. You can go to the Facebook group. You can go to Instagram. Uh, we're working on getting a little more like connected to you. So as that process happens, as Tabitha said, you can get your email to us if you want to be more connected. Um, and you know, this is not, um, we're not, we're not really selling anything. And if ever we are, we're going to tell you real clear in the front, we have some rules and ethics around like what are, um, what is it like when you have a financial, uh, oh shoot. You know what I'm talking about when you go to do a, like if you go to do a continuing education uh, presentation and you have like a conflicting relationship where like you work for a pharmaceutical company, you actually have to like name it in the beginning. Tabitha and I take our ethics super seriously. We talk about the ethics of having a clinical license and having an online presence all the time. Yep. Um, so 
All that to say, we're so glad you came. If you stuck all the way through and listened to this, and for all of my um, all of my AA hating and my AA loving folks, this one's for you. All right, thank you guys for being here. Bye, everybody. Bye.